Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is April the 14th, 2018. We're in Panama City, and the congregation of Yahweh is bringing you this message. Wish you were here. Well, today um, we had the person who would be normally given the sermonette, Frank Fisher, uh, suffer a back accident. And as a consequence, uh, we're going to be combining the sermon and the sermonette today. Maybe a little bit long, but uh, I, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, about two Sabbaths ago, uh, I gave uh, a sermonette, and it concerned the, uh, the a chart that I had up here, the heading on the chart. A couple of people have asked me about it. Um, I'll put the chart up now so you can sort of understand how these questions came about and how they were resolved. <laughs> more likely, more, more likely the last mm. fish eye lens. <laughs> um, it concerned the title uh, Month of Nisan, in parentheses, Aviv, 31 AD Julian calendar. The question was, well, how can you? be so sure that it was 31 AD. Uh, quickly, um, there have been some prominent astronomers who have uh, determined the same date. One of them was a German astronomer by the name of Schock, and uh, another one was an Englishman by the name of J.K. Forthingham. If you, if you look in the literature, you'll see their names crop, uh, crop up. Well, people would, uh, be interested in the subject now because it's the Passover season or Passover time. And so many people wrote letters to the United States Naval Observatory that finally they published a page just dealing with that subject. And it was called a Spring uh, Phenomena. And I have made a copy of it. Uh, if you go online, You'll see the exact same thing. And it consists of three pages. The United States Naval Observatory Astronomical Applications, Spring Phenomena 25 BCE to 38 CE. Uh, BCE is before the Common Era. Uh, people didn't want to use BC and AD because of the religious connotations. Well, uh, the thing about this chart is the, the preface it says, the two epochs of time that are, are reflected here is astronomical new moons on or preceding and after the date of the equinox. And you've heard me, you've heard me mention this before. I want to emphasize it. On or before is one epoch of time and after is another epoch of time. They're not they're not the same things. In this chart here, what, what, what there is are calculations that are based upon uh, the works of the Belgian astronomer Jean Mies, M-E-E-S-E. -E. And what Jean Mies did, he died uh, probably about 20 years ago. And what he did was is he took the average period of illumination the average period in which the new moon crescent appears. Why? Because he could see it. Remember in Genesis it says, 
that I'll give you the sun, the moon, and the stars, or star constellations. There's three luminaries that give off light for four purposes of science, for appointed times, days, and years. And even today, if you had no calendar or any other means at hand, you can do the same thing that Moses and others in ancient times did. You can determine the calendar. Now, in general terms, you can look out and see, well, things are turning green, huh? Must be spring again. You know, the brown leaves are gone. That was, it was cold, it was winter. Now, everything's turning green. And so, uh, and as I mentioned last time, they use a, a sun pole, a gnome like this, and the sun would cast a shadow on, on a straight line only on the two days. Remember the spring equinox in the northern hemisphere and the equinox, autumnal equinox. Uh, the sun travels over the top and down the other side, casting a straight line. Um, what followed that were sundials of various kinds and things of that nature. But the, the point of the matter is these people could do it. They did it routinely. And it was so common, it, uh, it's not detailed in the scriptures. In the scriptures it says, this month shall be uh, the first month of the year to you. This month shall be Aviv. It was the first month that was named. It says the first month of the year to you. First month from when? Well, <laughs> it's from the spring equinox. But that wasn't close enough. The moon, the spring equinox, is a solar determinant and the moon is a lunar determinant. So after, after the uh, equinox, the first new moon crescent, and that's a, in some places it's called a delimiter, some places it's called a marker and so forth, but it was something that man could see it rises up about 20 minutes after sunset. And you can see it for probably 15 minutes or so, and then it d disappears. And everybody knew about it, and so uh, the months, what we call months now, which is a Latin word, was called moons in those days. So it was the Aviv moon, or the moon of Aviv. And that's, and that's uh, really all that needs to be said about it. Sufficient to show that the United States Naval Observatory divided this, these epochs into two periods, on or before and after. And the reason it's that way is because the equinox and the solstices are the last day of the season ending. A day that begins in the winter is a day of winter until however it was reckoned to begin, that same reckoning is used to note the end. Now, uh, the other thing I'd like you to remember, I say it frequently to reinforce its remembrance, is that you cannot begin the year in the winter. Cannot begin the year in the winter. And remember, <clears throat> the winter, summer, spring, and fall are Roman divisions, and they are solar. Roman divisions by uh, four seasons, and, uh, and it's a Roman term. Israel had only two seasons for the most part. Plowing and planting, when you had the early rains, softened the earth, they plowed it, sowed the seeds, and then you had the, the harvesting and the gathering. And that roughly describes the agriculture year in, in Israel. At the time of our Savior, the Julian calendar was in existence. And it was named after Julius Caesar. <laughs> he learned that the Egyptians counted their year 365 days. And so he did the same thing. 
Well, of course, we know that the year is about 365 and one fourth day long. And if you add up a fourth, a fourth, a fourth, a fourth soon you, about every four years, you accumulate a day. Well, this error causes, because the days are observed based on the solar calendar, these days have a tendency to uh, uh, be celebrated earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier until one year uh, Passover occurred before the spring equinox. Well, the rabbis knew about this era and did really nothing about it until Passover occurred before the spring equinox, immediately before the spring equinox, and that was it. Had, something had to be done. So Pope Gregory at the time, he uh, entertained um, uh, proposals to correct this mistake and uh, proposals were submitted uh, one was accepted and what that uh, the one that was accepted had this basis one ten days would be taken out of the calendar so <laughs> instead of it being say June the 24th it was now June the 4th and there was uh, a lot of uh, uh, problems. People didn't want to change and so forth. But uh, it took about 200 years. But finally, the last country got on the same page as everybody else. And I think it was someplace in the Ukraine or in that general area, about 1923. So okay, now everybody's on the same page. And now we, we go by the Gregorian calendar. And the second part of it was, is every four years, remember it was a, we're out of whack uh, because the Earth orbits 365 in a fourth day. Every four years, you gotta compensate for that build uh, uh, up of an additional day. There's a third part, which uh, comes about from uh, years that are divisible by 400 and things like that. So, so what that system is, uh, does, is it keeps the calendar pretty much uh, where the seasons occur, where they supposed to occur, according to uh, solar solar reckoning, not lunar reckoning. That's a different ballpark. Different ballpark. Now, I put this chart together uh, based upon work that was originally done by Frederick Coulter. His books are back in the back. Uh, this is the uh, two books. One of them was The Harmony of the Gospels in Modern English. Whoops, this book. And there's another one called uh, The Christian Passover. Unfortunately, they're not sacred name publications, but they're very good. Coulter, he, he wrote A Harmony of the Gospels, and I happened to get a copy of his previous work in about 1973. 50 years before 1973, Coulter determined that A.T. Robinson, who had done the original work, uh, there had been there had been no revisions, no update in that 50 years, and that's why he that's what motivated him to go ahead and do his first harmony of the Gospels, and uh, <coughs> then later on he revised it, added to it, and we're fortunate enough to have his work. Uh, he was with Worldwide, uh, left Worldwide to form his uh, own uh, church. He's a Greek scholar, a learned man. His whole life has been uh, devoted to the Bible. I really wish that, uh, that he comes to the knowledge of the sacred name, but be that as it may, uh, we have at least the knowledge of what he did and we can put in the sacred names as necessary. Okay, now that the housekeeping chores are out of the way, I want to uh, uh, start with the premise of this chart. Now, this chart includes some data that uh, I put in because um, Coulter, if he had a, a date that he could not correlate to a day, 
uh, if he had a, a date in Scripture or identifiable time in Scripture, and he couldn't correlate it, he left it blank. And if you see his early book, you'll see certain days here that'll be blank. Well, what I did is to spend a, a lot of time trying to figure out logically what might have been uh, uh, going on that day. And so we're now going to start, and we're going to go over it day by day, and I will supplement this chart with some other visual aids. And I think it will be informative. Here he says, uh, here he starts his, um, with Luke 19.5. And the, the key thing is, is, he tells Zacharias, come down immediately, I must stay at your house today. Now, logically, that doesn't make any sense, just out of context. But the fact of the matter is, is he was traveling, verses prior to this, they were traveling from Jericho, and they were going to Jerusalem. So I didn't uh, include all of the verses here, but this is the key, vote, key verse where he tells Zacharias, come down out of the tree. Now, Zacharias, you remember the scripture was, he's a short guy, he was a tax collector, uh, chief tax collector. And um, so the long and the short of it is, is our savior and his disciples stayed at Zacharias' house. Quite likely, they stayed for lunch. I don't know that's pure supposition. But the distance from Jericho, and there were five cities by the name of Jericho, located in the same general area, uh, not identifiable today, except the, the last one. So they were traveling from there to Jerusalem. Jerusalem from Jericho is a thousand foot higher in elevation the road is crooked, but those uh, fellows were much hardier, stronger uh, than we are today. But it's a distance about 18 miles, and I, I tried it to walk from my house to the mall and back, and it took me about five, six hours. It's, uh, uh, I actually did it in four hours, but the fact is the road is straight, <laughs> got a sidewalk to walk on. And uh, it's doable, it's doable. But we also have to remember that as our Savior was going along, he, he was now very well known that his performing of miracles had brought him fame. And all along the way, there would be people who would come out for healing and he would heal them. Well, how did they know he was coming? Well, part of the entourage were people who would be running ahead and and be announcing you know, his coming. We know that uh, because of the scriptures. Well, Zacharias, come down, I'm gonna stay at your house. Now, if you go, if you look in Mark 20, 19, I'm sorry, Matthew 20, 19, and Mark 10, 4, uh, 10 46. He went out from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the way he heals the sick. So the statement I made is based upon these scriptures here. Mark 11, 11, Yeshua entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple. He looked around, uh, but as it was now late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Well, what did he see? I went through Coulter's book and I made copies of uh, some of the, the pages and I'll hand them out. You can just skim them real quick. Uh, and what it shows... Anthony, there's a version of Coulter's book available as a PDF online. Would you like to send your copy? I don't know, but uh, it, you say it is? A PDF, yeah. Oh. We have the hardbound copies, and Brenda has asked that we order two more cases for there's, people. There's a PDF. Oh, that's, that's good to know. Thank you. Now, if you look at this chart, the first thing that you see uh, is that uh, the temple was surrounded by a colonnade. It's a big place. The colonnade was large. The temple, quite small. 
So as he comes into this area, the first thing that he sees is, is all the money changers and all of the people that are selling doves and so forth. Uh, the entire temple court is covered by merchants. You can see their little tents and so forth. Now this is an artist's rendition. It's not, it's not an absolute fact. But there's enough scripture which shows that he overturned the tables of the money changers and the people that were selling the doves and he uh, ran out uh, people who were taking shortcuts through the temple courts and in some places you'll see it called the temple precincts so basically the same thing except this was this uh, area was divided into the court in which the the hebrews uh, went and uh, the other half is the uh, court of the Gentiles. Well, you know, I sat down and tried to figure out um, how could he go into an area as big as this is and clear it out? Well, the Bible says the Bible says that he uh, made a cord, made a whip out of the cords, and that's what they commonly would put, uh, would hold up their tunic with. Okay, he would go into there, and he would uh, uh, let it be known what they were doing was against the law. You know, you you don't, you do not. You do not make his father's house a den of merchandise. The very words that he used. Well, A, he comes in, he's very well known, and he starts cleansing the place uh, of this merchant, these merchants, money changers, and so forth. And you know that if they were selling doves, they were also selling lambs. Why? Because they were commonly sacrificed and there would be male goats, they were sacrificed. So the people that would come into this area, they were there to, to uh, uh, sacrifice uh, both uh, as a burnt offering and as a, a sin offering. It's a very large area and you can imagine that as soon as he started uh, telling uh, and persuading some of these merchants to get out of there, Others heard it and left without having to be told. And the other thing is, is how could our father's house become a den of merchandise and the high priest not know it? Or the priesthood not know it? The temple guard didn't stop him. The Roman guards certainly didn't stop him. They were, they were to have nothing to do with the religious activities of the Hebrews. So he went in and cleaned the place out and nobody dared lift a finger. Well, he leaves and he goes across the Kidron Valley and let's see where he, where he stays. Yeshua entered Jerusalem, went to the temple, he looked all around. But as it was now late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Bethany's up on the top of the Mount of Olives, which is across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem, from the gates. Next day, now this is the five of the Sabbath, the eve of the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the one of the Sabbath, the two of the Sabbath. This is how they reckon days. They didn't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They reckoned it by numbers. Those names for days were given by the Romans. Um, we have a time marker at John 12, verses 1 to 3. He arrived six days before Passover at Lazarus' house. Six days before Passover. One, two, three, four, five. Passover, six. John 12, 
verses 12 to 18. In the morning, in the morning. Okay, this, this dark area is night. The light portion is day. We're going paragraph B, that corresponds to just after sunrise. In the morning, a great multitude had come to the feast, that had come to the feast, went out uh, of Jerusalem and spread palm branches, and Yeshua rides the colt of an ass, obtained at Bethpage, the village facing them on the way to Jerusalem from Bethany. Beth Page means house of unripe figs. So, about this time, early morning, they leave uh, Lazarus's house and they go down the Kedron Valley and come up the other side. Mark 11:15. Yeshua goes into the temple courts. That's the big area that you see with the colonnades around it drives out those buying and selling doves and overthrows the tables of the money changers and he would not permit merchandise to be carried through the temple. Mark 11:18. This came to the ears of the chief priests and the scribes and they tried to find some way of doing away with Yeshua. They were afraid of him because the people were carried away by his teaching and miracles. Now we're going to go to C. Uh, e, I'm sorry. Mark, uh, Matthew 21, 17. And evening came. Evening came. And they went to Bethany and stayed here, stayed there the night, likely at Lazarus' house. The scriptures don't say where they stayed. Excuse me, Anthony. I'm only counting five days. You got Passover. The day before Passover would be... One, no, two. No, that would be the day of, the day before. They counted inclusively. But that's not before. I'm just reading the scriptures like it's written, and right. I'm using I'm using Coulter's chart. I really. That, I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to. I'm just asking number wise. I'm not. I, I'll, the, can you wait until I get through and then okay. I'll look at it? Sure. Uh, what I'm trying to show here is that the. The, the verses that are in the scriptures, we don't have a time reference for them. Occasionally there is a marker, but occasionally we don't. So how can we fit out, sit down and take the verses and fit them into a timeline? Now, uh, this is the month of Nisan, formerly called Aviv, uh, before the Babylonian captivity. Now this is the Sabbath. It's Saturday, male lamb, from the sheep or the goats, without a blemish is set apart. This is the 14th, 13th, 12th, 11th, 10th. Ten days before Passover, you take a lamb, separate it from the flock, examine it, make sure that it's a perfect animal, with no, no blemishes and so forth. So this, this was a significant event. And it was, this is in uh, accordance to, to the scriptures. Now this is one of those instances where the four Gospels do not mention this Sabbath or specific activities referenced to it. So how do we know that this likely occurred? Because we know Passover occurred on a Wednesday. Now everybody's going to wonder, well how can we be assured that Passover occurred on a Wednesday? In the chart that I previously uh, had up here, the roll down, uh, the time period of Passover, a few years before and a few years after our Savior's uh, ministry, are shown. And again, it was because so many people wanted to know uh, when Passover occurred. Well, using the work of Gene Meese, they have come out and, and determined that Passover only occurred twice during the period of 25 BCE and 38 CE, only twice. One of those is too early. Our Savior was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. One of the days when it, Passover occurred on a Wednesday, he would have been too young. 31 AD, 
fits. And I'll show you, if we have time, why 30 AD does not fit. In the morning, after they had left Bethany, now this is in Matthew 21, 18, he curses the fig tree, perhaps near Bethpage, which means house of unripe fit. In Matthew 21 to 23 to 24 to 36, Yeshua had gone into the temple and was teaching when the chief priests and the elders asked, well, what authority have you for acting like this? His response consists of several parables, teaching, and eight woe to you admonishments. If you can visualize around the temple itself, in the colonnades, there would be people, teachers, rabbis, and there would be small groups of people gathered around him, perhaps to hear some teaching on some point of the law of the Torah. Just imagine our Savior seated between the colonnades with another uh, small group of people. When he was teaching in the temple, it was not in the temple physically. It was in the temple precincts, the temple courts. The temple itself was a relatively small building. And and a, a, a large a public gathering wouldn't fit, would not fit. Matthew 21, 18, see the letter A, here's A, it's dawn, it is in the morning, another time marker. After they had left Bethany, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 11, 20, in the morning as they were passing by the fig tree, and saw that it had dried up, and again, they came into Jerusalem. Another time marker. The time markers are shown here in bold. Matthew, I'm sorry, that was Mark 11, 20. Matthew 26, 2. Early, people came to Yeshua, uh, taught death uh, daily in the temple, and he says, you know that in two days, the Passover meal, and I put the meal between brackets, is to be kept. And I'll explain why in a little while. Mark 14, 1. Now the Passover meal and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were to come in two days. One, two. And Yeshua sent Peter and John into the city to get the room, quote, where I may eat the Passover. Okay. Paragraph D. It was about the middle part of the day or probably uh, mid-afternoon. Cannot guarantee these times. These are just uh, what seems logical. Mar uh, Matthew 24, 1 to 51, and 25, 1 to 46, and 26, 6. Yeshua leaves the temple and goes to the Mount of Olive, sits, views the city, and makes the Olivet Discourse. On those handouts, you can see that the temple was quite tall. At an elevation of 2,500 feet, as you approach the mount, you would see the temple. Not totally, but you'd see probably the upper half. It was quite likely made out of limestone, marble, so it would be white. The sun reflecting on it would make it stand out. And even the, even the disciples remarked to our Savior, about the grandeur of the buildings that were there. Matthew 24, 1, I'm sorry, uh, Mark 14, 3, he returns to Bethany and like, likely to the house of Simon the leper. It was not uncommon for people to go to the Mount of Olives and spend the night there. There were areas that were uh, like gardens, uh, uh, not flower gardens, but e even in the UK today, if you go to somebody's house, they'll refer to the backyard, what we call the backyard, as a garden, as the garden. And usually around the perimeter they made bushes and flowers and stuff like that. Whereas we call it, it a backyard, they refer to it differently. 
And so they would, it was not uncommon for people to go to these places and part of their uh, dress was to have a, a shawl, a wrap that would go around them. You frequently see Greek statues where a man has this and it, it, it lays over his arm. And we have uh, uh, instances in the Bible where it admonishes somebody each night, give the man back his cloak, this wrapping here. And what they would do is they would lay it down, get on it, and then pull it up over them and sleep outside. Okay. Now, this being Passover, you remove the leaven from the houses. Mark 14, 3, while at supper, at the house of Simon the leper, a woman breaks an alabaster cruise and anoints Yeshua's head. That's not according to the Last Supper pictures that are all over the world. People didn't sit in chairs, they lounged, they laid down, they supported themselves with their left elbow and arm and they ate with their right hand. She would not have crawled under the table if there, would, if there had been one to anoint his feet and, and, and wipe them with their hair. They were laying on like couches or something and their feet would have radiated out from the, from the table such that she could just simply walk up and break the cruise and, and, uh, and put it on his feet. There was some years ago a guy by the name of Wayne Leeper, and he used to teach uh, as a Bible student, a uh, teacher, uh, this very subject. And so I have his book here today, and I want to show you how the table and likely uh, the people likely were around the table. And there's some reasons it's this way. This is the, uh, the right side of the host, which would have been the second person. That was our Savior, Yeshua. How can we know this? Because it says John, the youngest apostle, and the youngest person invited to this gathering or feast, they would be lying in the first position. In that way, the scripture which says that he leaned over on the breast of our Savior. Well, you can see that if our Savior was on his left elbow eating with his right elbow, John, who was next to him, situated the same way, could have simply leaned back and he would have been against our Savior's breast. On the other side, on the third position, that was the position for the honored guest. Now, <laughs> we know from the scriptures that the, the disciples were kind of talking amongst themselves as to who was the most important or the highest rank or something like that, that deserved this honored position. Judas grabbed it. How do we know that? because our Savior turns to him, and he's, remember, he's on his elbow, and he says, what you do, do quickly. Now, none of the other disciples heard it. Peter, who was opposite John, he didn't hear it, because look where he's at. You know, he's one person over. And he asked John on the opposite side, what did he say? Well, we know that Judas got up immediately. I'm sorry. We know that Judas got up immediately and everybody thought that he went out to buy uh, supplies for the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. But that we know from reading scriptures that he went out and betrayed our Savior. The rest of the, the, rest of the seats that are around here uh, could have been occupied by any of the apostles, anyone really. The main thing to be noted here is this. 
that that provides the customs and there are uh, mosaics that are in existence that show this uh, type of reclining on cushions was the way that people normally uh, re, uh, 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 set or uh, not set but attended these these types of <coughs> gatherings servants slaves stood they didn't sit they didn't lay down they stood and so it was known you know if you were a slave owner you were reclined if you were a slave you stood and anybody walking in the room would immediately know that he's a slave he's a slave he's a slave so there, there are there are reasons why uh, we can believe that these types of things are true Says, while at supper at the house of Simon the leper, I read, I'm sorry. Then the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas and made plans to kill Yeshua. It must not be during the festivities. There must be no disturbance among the people. It's talking about doing something during daylight hours when everybody was there. When when the verses talk about them coming out of Jerusalem to, to greet our Savior with palm branches, it says out of Jerusalem. People who lived in Jerusalem had guest chambers. <laughs> they were very small rooms, but it was an honor that if you were a citizen of, of Jerusalem uh, to have a guest chamber. Now during the feast days, it was little more than something to keep your head uh, dry when it rained uh, People didn't eat in there or do anything what all they did principally was to sleep it Was to provide shelter because the nights and arid climates like Jerusalem can be quite cold so during other times ie non feast day uh, Times the room might have um, goods stored in it or furniture or something like that but during the feast day that would be moved out and these rooms would be provided and of course all of the all of the inns uh, would be full and uh, and we know from scriptures related to the birth of our Savior that when the, uh, Mary and Joseph M Miriam and Joseph came uh, to seek room at the end, there was none. Why? Because the town was overflowing with people. And so were the surrounding towns like Bethany and Bethpage and, and so forth. Uh, it, it, was, it was something that happened several times a year, especially for the pilgrimage feasts. Days of Unleavened Bread, uh, the Feast of Weeks, and Tabernacles. Judas goes to the chief priests that he might deliver up Yeshua. That's when he left at the Last Supper. And evening came, and Yeshua sat down with the twelve. Here is, here is uh, evening, right here. It's just before sunset, and they sat down and had the evening meal. The difference uh, in what they did and what the Jewish population did nationally is this. They had their evening meal after sunset when it was dark. The scriptures tell us it was dark. Therefore, it would have actually have occurred here. This being night, it would have occurred at the beginning of the night. Now, John 13, 29, and some, this is uh, disciples, thought that since Judas had the money bag, Yeshua was telling them to buy what was needed 
for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I inserted that. And he immediately went out and it was night. Now the scriptures say it was night. Yeshua prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, because of me this night. Again, time marker, night, night. This is here, the beginning, mid, before midnight. He was betrayed, seized, taken to Kenaniah courtyard. And Peter denies our Savior. We know the reference to the cock crowing. He's then sent to Caiaphas, the high priest. He was condemned by the Sanhedrin, mocked and beaten. Let me back up a moment. The Sanhedrin uh, was not necessarily religious. Uh, group. It was more of a civil governing body. But in those days, uh, the governing, governance of the Jews and the, the religious uh, authorities uh, operated kind of like this. Now he's betrayed, seized, and taken to Kenaniah, the courthouse. Peter denies. He sent to Caiaphas, the high priest. He's condemned by the Sanhedrin, mocked and beaten. Pilate sends Yeshua to Herod, who then returns him to Pilate. Yeshua is condemned, scourged, and led out to be executed about noon. So look, here we have B in the beginning of the night, our Savior praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, because of me this night. C, he's betrayed, seized, and taken to Cananiah. D, now, by now it's it's uh, approaching dawn. He's he's uh, sent he's sent to the high priest. And of course we know he was condemned by the Sanhedrin. By now it's early morning. Now there were these were old guys. They were old guys, and so they didn't rack them out of bed in the middle of the night. They waited until it was daylight. Just gotten to be daylight and so these old people the old guys went there and did what they did Pilate sends Yeshua to Herod who then returns in the Pilate remember that Herod wanted to see a miracle here was this famous person he wanted to see, he wanted to see a miracle Yeshua is condemned, scourged, and led out to be executed about noon. About here. Yeshua dies about 3 p.m. and is covered with a linen cloth and placed in the tomb just before sunset. Probably about 5 to 6 p.m. Now, you will have uh, Sunday keepers who will who will say, well, look, uh, this is a Wednesday. We know that this happened on Good Friday. <laughs> Wrong. Did not happen on Good Friday. What's good about our Savior being uh, killed on Good Friday? It didn't happen. It's a myth. It's a myth. And in the paper that we have called The Myth of the Good Friday Death, Easter Sunday Resurrection, this chart is in that paper. Okay, Yeshua dies between the evenings, between the evenings, and as the sun goes down, when it first touches the horizon, is the beginning of the evening, and when the sun goes down and it's no longer visible, it's the other evening. So his death was between the evenings. Ben Ha Avarim. Ben Ha Avarim. Okay. The famous uh, prophecy by our Savior with his own lips is totally ignored by this world. He says, there shall be no sign given this evil and adulterous generation except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, uh, a belly of the great fish, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Okay. Three days and three nights is 72 hours. 
The scripture says, Yeshua dies and is covered with a linen cloth and placed in the tomb just before sunset. Again, about 5 or 6 p.m. Now, sunset now, this is about the time when this would have happened. It's, you've got plenty of light till about 7.30. So, he was buried on Passover day or entombed, not buried, entombed is technically correct, just before sunset. Day one, day two, day three. Yeshua arrives from the dead just before sunset. One, two, three. As he had predicted about his own self, that he would be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And when Miriam of Magdala went to the tomb, the tomb was open. He wasn't there because he had already risen just before sunset on the Sabbath. A weekly Sabbath. A weekly Sabbath. Okay, the first day of unleavened bread. Uh, so this is the first night and day that Yeshua, the anointed, is in the tomb. Night and day. Jewish reckoning, like in Genesis, it was the evening and the morning, the first day of the evening and the morning, the second day of the evening. The days begin in darkness. So it's sunset to sunset. <coughs> now, on Mark 14, 12, the Passover meal was eaten by the nation of Israel. Notice that they're eating it at the beginning of the 15th. Whereas our Savior ate the Passover meal at the beginning of the 14th. Exactly the same time that Moses had the Israelites eat the Passover meal. And yet today, you will have people, Jewish uh, relations, saying that the 15th is uh, the, the day you're supposed to eat it, eat the meal. What happened on the 15th in Moses' time? After they had eaten the meal, at the beginning at sunset of the 13th, on the night of the 14th, they were beginning the exodus, being organized and so forth, and they were leaving. And it says that they, on the 15th, that they left Egypt by night, by night. They traveled day and night for three days, 24 hours a day. And remember the scripture says that uh, they didn't have time for their bread to rise. Well, they traveled three days, very large number of people, very large number of animals, three days out of Ramses. That's where they left from, three days out of Ramses. Well, it took them a while for, took the Egyptians a while to realize what they had done. And so they decided to go whip up on them. Well, they were down the road quite a bit by then, but Egyptians were in chariots, very strong horses, and pursued them. But in Yeshua's time, uh, we see that In, in Matthew 27, oops, I'm sorry. In Matthew 27, 62 to 66, the next day, a time marker, John 1931, it was an high day. Here's Passover. Here's the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's called an high day in the Gospels. First day of the, and the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread are high days. They're annual Sabbaths. Mark 27, 62 to 66. Uh, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread after the preparation as Passover was called. This is Passover in those days. It was also called the preparation preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Even so now, when we go to do the scriptural calendar, 
we go to Herb Zelensky's webpage. If you look at if you look at the uh, uh, the dates and, uh, of, of events, he doesn't list Passover. Absolutely accurate in every other respect, he doesn't list list Passover. He has a Jewish background, uh, reads and writes German and Hebrew, uh, a real scholar, but he doesn't list Passover. Passover is a memorial, and, and tomorrow you'll hear people say, well, uh, we, uh, we celebrate the, re the resurrection. The Bible doesn't command us to observe the resurrection. It commands us to memorialize his death. Death, not resurrection from death. And that's a subtle point, and yet there's a lot of people who just don't grasp the difference here. They're just words. They don't study things in depth. Um, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered outside the praetorium to talk to Pilate, who told them to secure and seal the tomb with their temple guard. Some translations will say soldiers, inference being Roman soldiers. <laughs> when Pilate is talking to these guys, it's in a condescending manner. You got a temple guard. Go make it as secure as you can. Don't bug me. <laughs> now, I'm talking a little bit about these temple guards. There are 12 gates around the temple. If you look on the renderings there, you can, you can count, I think, six of them, and there's six on the opposite side. Uh, those gates were not open all day and all night long, but you can rest assured they were probably open 12 hours or so a day, assuming two uh, guards, temple guards, at each gate. 12 times two is 24. There would be another set of guards to relieve the, the first watch. So there's 48. During this period, there would be guards who would be off duty. They might be eating, bathing, whatever. So there would be uh, guards who, who could be brought in to serve should the regular guard assigned to the duty become ill or something like that. So, okay, dust double the number of guards. Now you're up to 96. It surely was that included administrative people like the captain of the guard and, and the person over all of the captains. It surely included uh, food preparation personnel and other things that were, were support services for uh, the temple guards. They didn't go, the, the religious establishment did not go into the praetorium because it was pagan. To them, it was pagan. So Pilate goes out and meets them in the court. They don't go into the inside because it was pagan. And he tells them to seal the tomb as best you can because they told him that unless you put a guard around the tomb, they're gonna come and steal him and then they're gonna claim that he arose and so forth. He said, go put a, a seal on it as best you can. That's the case. The seal that they would commonly use is take a piece of lead and these tombs were sealed with a large disc of stone, thick, and it would roll, be rolled backwards and a little wedge put under it. To seal it, you take the wedge, push on the, on the stone, pull out the wedge and then let it roll close. And then take a strip of lead, put it across the top and peen it peen it into the stone between the, the round door, to speak, and the, the frame that it was closing. That's how they sealed it. This is the second night and day Yeshua the anointed is in the tomb. This is the eve of the Sabbath. This is the Friday. The days were first of the Sabbath, second of the Sabbath, third, fourth, fifth, and the sixth was the eve of the Sabbath, or Friday, and the seventh was the Sabbath. When the annual Sabbath was over, 
That's the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now this is subtle. And a lot of people tomorrow have not a clue as to the significance of these words. When the annual Sabbath was over, Miriam from Magdala and Miriam, the mother of James and Yaakov and Salome, bought, purchased spices that they might go and anoint Yeshua. Luke 23:56. They prepared the spices and the ointments. And I have here a little notation. The women could not have bought the spices and ointments until after sunset of Nisan 15. Here's Nisan 15. They could not have bought these until after sunset because it was an annual Sabbath. There's no stores open, no merchants, and it would have been doing work on the Sabbath. So they would have bought these after sunset. Um, when you have these little small shopkeepers and so forth, they were in business to, to make a profit. And they would open up or, or they would sell things after the normal, usual time to do things. Uh, bakeries, for example, would sell bread like they do today, here. You go out to Panera Bread. You can buy bread very early in the morning before it's commonly available. So they could not have bought the spices and the ointments before sunset of the 15th. Could not have bought them this side. Mark 16, 1. When the annual Sabbath was over, Miriam from Magdala and Miriam the mother of Salome bought the spices that they might go and anoint Yeshua. They, were, they prepared the spices and the ointments. The women, uh, I'm sorry, the lady that, that broke the cruise and washed Yeshua's feet back here and dried them with her hair, it says uh, uh, what, she, what was in the little cruise was spikenard. Some Bible translations just have the word nard. Um, nard is a, a small plant that grows uh, in the Himalayas at the foothills. And commonly, uh, it was a trade item from India. The bottle itself, the cruise, was alabaster, and it came from Egypt, from a little town called Alabastro. And, and that was the main industry of the town. It wasn't that big a town. And what they would do is uh, they'd get them a chunk of, of this white, so, uh, reddish, soft rock, and they would turn it like uh, somebody would make clay pots. And after they would shape it that way, they would drill a hole down to the top with something like a, an arrow that had a point that was made of obsidian. Obsidian is volcanic glass, very hard. And they would bore a hole straight down into uh, the, the solid stone flask. And then they would make a, a stopper that would go in it. Today, uh, if you go into a machine shop, uh, you'll see tools that have a, a marking on them. It says uh, BNS or Morse number five. Well, these are standard tapers that you can you can get these tools uh, to this taper. Both the taper itself and the hole that it goes in are exactly the same. If you keep if you start off with something like that, a taper like that, the stopper won't stay in. But if you make that a very shallow taper, you can put the stop it, the the uh, stopper in, and you won't be able to get it out. And that's why Morris taper and Brown and Sharp tapers are used for tools. You put the tool into the uh, head of the lathe and use it. You don't have to bolt it in or do anything. And when you got, need another tool, there's a handle down at the end. You pull the handle and it pokes it out. So these, these concepts like this, they were well known. Now, if you put the, two, the stopper in too tight, you'll never get it out. And it was very common to break the cruise. And the Bible says 
that's what she did. She broke the cruise, put the nard on his feet, and dried them with her hair. And we have another instance in the Bible where this was pulled over our Savior's head and it ran down his hair. So there, again, there's, <laughs> if one wishes to simple, uh, do simple research, all of the things in the Bible are readily explainable. Now the women could not have bought and prepared spices and ointments until after the sunset of the 15th because the shops wouldn't have been open or work, their work, permitted. Luke 23:56. But they rested on the weekly Sabbath. This is right out of the scriptures. Luke 23:56. They rested. This is the Sabbath. They rested. Mark 12, 40, Yeshua fulfills his prophecy. The Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Yeshua rises from the dead just before sunset. One, two, three. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Near sunset, the temple delegation goes out and selects barley sheaf to cut for the wave sheaf offering <coughs> then waits until the sun sets. They selected them, they selected the sheaves, but did not cut them. Why? Because it's the Sabbath and cutting them would have been work. They stood there till the sun went down, then they cut them. Then they cut them, had a sickle, cut them. And they brought them to the priest, even if it was darkness. Now, uh, um, we have some groups that make a big thing out of barley. You must have the barley before you can begin the scriptural year. Okay. It's completely felonious. This is something that the Kaorites have been pushing for years. But the fact of the matter is, in the scriptures, it is not, not a determinant for beginning the scriptural year. It's for the wave sheaf offering, which is after the 15th, of the year that's already begun. There was no barley during the 40 years that the Israelites wandered around in the desert. When they finally crossed the Jordan, being led by Joshua, went on the other side. There was a barley crop. It was very near the period we're in today. The crop had grown. It was planted by pagans. The Israelites didn't plant it. It was there. It was theirs because the land had been given to them and everything in it, the barns, the animals, everything and the crop, everything was given to them. So it was theirs, even if they didn't plant it. Now, uh, I've mentioned before about the fact that uh, one of the functions of the availability of barley is when it's planted. Nobody ever talks about that. Nobody ever talks about it. They just focus on when it's mature. So I have here a book that I've quoted from before. Oops, and I'll do it again. I've quoted from this book before and I'll do it again. It's The Temple, It's Ministry and Services by Alfred Ardersheim. And on page 200, 258 is a footnote Footnote number one, and it's the Mishnah Menachot 8. Now the Mishnah uh, uh, is a, a Jewish document, and the Menachot is divided, I think, into eight sections. And one of the sections uh, has to do with food. This one here is number eight. It's the one that has to do with food. Others have to do with women and animals and whatnot. Quote, the field was to be plowed in the autumn and sowed 70 days before Passover. Sowed 70 days before Passover. Sowed 70 days before Passover. Well, they had to know when Passover was going to occur. How would they know? The same method by uh, uh, people today can use. New moons, Crescents, count backwards, find out the, uh, the new moon crescent, add, add two weeks to it, 
because it was harvested on about the 15th, and put the seed in the ground. No big deal. Just count and do it. And yet today, there are people who will get up and they'll argue vehemently. You must be able to see barley in Jerusalem. One of the things that they don't mention is the fact that barley in Jerusalem that they're talking about is volunteer barley. If you didn't plant it, whatever fell off the stalk from the previous harvest fell into the ground, the Almighty willing, it would sprout up. That's called volunteers. And it could be wheat or spelt or anything like that that's not, that doesn't have human intervention. In other words, the human does not physically become involved in its planning. So, from Alfred Erdesheim, who was a rabbi, we know that the barley is uh, mature within the time period that he specifies here. Now, there are climatic things that will affect us, but the, the fact is, is that this can be plus or minus two weeks. If the barley is green, too green, well, you can parch the uh, ears. You can parch the ears and grind it and make flour. Uh, if you wait too long and just the impact of the sickle uh, will cause the kernels to fall off. You've got approximately 17 days. Now today in Israel, uh, barley is harvested mechanically and so they wait until very near the time when the kernels will fall off. Well, they're vacuuming them and, and they don't want them, uh, they don't want it green. So that's the story on barley. It's not a determinant for the scriptural year. Not a determinant for the scriptural year. It is necessary for the wave sheaf offering. After sunset, this is now the one of the Sabbath, this is Sunday, the fourth day of unleavened bread, and this is when the eight wave offering uh, occurs. And you begin the count of the seven Sabbaths plus the morrow. Seven times seven is 49. Shall be seven Sabbaths, Sabbath weeks. Whole weeks they shall be and the morrow. Seven times seven is 49 plus one is 50. And that's how many days it has to be. After sunset, the delegation cuts the barley sheaves, bring them to the priest. Mark, uh, Matthew 28, 1 to 15. After the weekly Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, the temple guards flee to the chief priest and tell about the earthquake and the empty tomb and are bribed to lie and say that they slept on duty. Right there, absolute proof they were not Roman soldiers as some people have in their translation. If you slept on duty and you were Roman soldiers, your own men would kill you. Because if, the, if, if that rule was ever violated, then the entire legion could get wiped out by a surprise attack. Very serious business. The Romans... The Romans practiced war all day long, fighting, maneuvers, things like that, all day long. And they were extremely efficient at things. One of the things they were efficient at is crucifying people. They had it down to a science. And once they hung you on, on the stake, they would leave. They didn't care. The family had the responsibility of taking these people down. Otherwise, they let the birds, the ravens pick them to death, pick, pick the flesh. So, again, they didn't hang around, they just simply left. And it must have been busy a uh, time for them. On John, in John 20, 17, I have not yet ascended to the Father, Yahweh, Yeshua is the first of the first fruits of mankind 
analogous to the first fruits of the barley crop the priests make with the wave sheaf offering this morning to Yahweh. Here's D in the morning. That's when, that's when they would have made it. Luke 24, 13. Now then on the same day Yeshua appears to the two on the way to Emmaus. Besides, quote, besides all this, one of them's talking, this is the third day since these things came to pass. Some of the women having been uh, early at the tomb. Third day, again, they're counting inclusively. One day, two day, three days. John 20, 19, it was evening on the first of the week when the doors were shut. Now that's when our Savior appeared to them. Ask him to have anything to eat. And the last time here, you, we've had seven days up to Passover, and then we're talking five days afterwards. It's the fifth day of unleavened bread, and you can read John 20, 19 for the, the events which followed. Well, um, I hope uh, having a timeline like this and a little bit of an explanation has been informative. Uh, most people, many people, do not ever have the opportunity to see something like this and see how it fits together. I give you thanks. <laughs>